Warning, the podcast you're about to hear has a unique conservative perspective and may be politically incorrect, containing some controversy in its message. This episode may speak out against liberalism, socialism, the dark state, and religious organizations. It is possible that evil in politics, education, law, society, and religion will be discussed and exposed. However, we believe this podcast adds truth and value to a mature, disenfranchised audience who may be tired of apostate religions and wicked world systems. Listeners who are easily offended, overly sensitive, or have progressive leanings sympathetic to the topics we expose should be forewarned not to listen any further. We thank both those who choose to listen as well as those who choose not to listen. You've been warned. And now, let us get on with the show. And now, let us get on with the show. It is December 27th, 2019. That's correct. And you are listening to the Freedom Friday Hour. Contained within the Kapow Radio Show. So here's the deal. We've got some news stories to talk about. First, I want to talk about what's going on at FifthHookMedia.com. Fifth Hook Media. Okay, we took on a, uh, a project called Spiritual Transformation Series. It's Pastor Dennis Lee from Living Waters Fellowship in Mesquite, Nevada. He's a, he's a smart guy. He has a couple of a master's degree, one in theology, one in uh, divinity. He's been around a long time. He used to pastor... He was the lead pastor in Las Vegas for many years at a, uh, a big church called, I believe it was called Hallelujah Fellowship, if I remember correctly, uh, before coming to Mesquite uh, several years ago. And the uh, Living Water Fellowship just moved into a new building. They continue to, to grow at a decent pace, not, not, too, not too big, not too much. And they just, uh, just um, moved into a new building there process of kind of getting it all together and stuff but he's got a he's got a a heart for getting the message out he um he's a very prolific writer writes all the time i mean uh, when you subscribe to his email blast you'll probably get uh at least three emails a day it'll be a blog it'll be food for thought uh it might be another type of deal he uh He's on Facebook, uh, Twitter. He's just writing all the time. He has two, two books out. Part of his transfer, his spiritual transformation series books um, about being transformed spiritually to Christ is what that means. It's not some new age stuff. He's um, he's conservative down the down the biblical pipeline, and he writes so much. And when I asked him, like man, you know, when do you have time to do all this stuff and why? <laughs> uh, he, he said that he just felt that his, the time on earth is short and that um, it's to get the message out and uh, it just has an urgency to, you know, get the message out. And there's, um, there's other pastors and ministers in Kenya, Africa, who uh, are really into Dennis and they, uh, they actually walk miles um, to a local library, to a, a town, a local library, so they can access the internet and then look at his uh, notes and things. What he does is he he puts his sermons on the Living Waters uh, website, and he has the whole sermon, all his whole sermon notes, the whole bit are, are, are there as well as the audio. So anyway, he's um, he's really big on sharing. So uh, one day I'm sitting there. And he's mentioning how he'd like to start a podcast and do this and do that. So after service, I went, well, I can do that for you. And so we, uh, we, that's what we did. So every day he puts out something on the spiritual transformation series. And, uh, and the thing is, is when he writes his blog, there are 333 words. That's what he does. He goes three, three, three. That's why he calls them the three, three, three uh, blogs. So when you put it in audio, it's less than five minutes with 
Uh, Miss Kapow does the introduction and Miss Kapow does the ending. Uh, she does the commercial for his books and then the um, basically his bio at the end. So when you put it all together, it's less than five minutes. So every day, if you get a little um, like a devotion, there are 333 three, three devotions is what they are. And you get this every day. So it's just a little shot in the arm for breakfast. Of course, you can listen to it right on our site, Fifth Hook Media. On our Facebook page, you can go to fifthhookmedia.com, and I have a player right there on the front page. Now, I, sometimes, you know, when you when you use the mobile phone, it goes to a, a mobile website that I can't get rid of. <laughs> and um, it, But if, if you land on that mobile site, and it looks just kind of weird and cheesy, if you scroll down, it says desktop site. That's what you want. Of course, if you're on a computer... You know, go to your, the desktop site is what you want. So the, the landing page of Fifth Hook Media will have a player, a podcast player. So we'll have all his podcasts there. Also, if you just go to kapowradioshow.com, you can listen to all our shows and his uh, show. We have, I have two players right there on the front of uh, kapowradioshow.com. And of course, like us, he's available on Spotify, iTunes, and all these other places also. So we just started this last week. I think he has five shows up. So if you get a chance, uh, listen to him. It's um, it's a good little devotion. I enjoy doing the the show for him, and um, you know the topics he does talk about. So that's that's about it. That's what I want to say. You know the 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 new year's coming up, and so we're kind of retooling some things on uh, our Monday show. Uh, we're going to, you know, get back to biblical studies and studying God's word and things like that. Miss Kapow and I got, um, we ordered his and hers systematic theology textbooks by Wayne Grudem. Uh, uh, Wayne Grudem is a Calvinist, but he's a very good teacher. I've heard him uh, speak on uh, YouTube and stuff like that. And I like him. I like his spirit. And I like about him, though I don't uh, agree. I'm not a Calvinist and I don't agree a hundred percent with all the Calvinism. Um, you know, I, I, I take the meat, and spit out the bones. Okay. Cause the rest of it is real good stuff like that. So when it comes to hard, the hardcore Calvinistic viewpoint, I, I won't teach that, but um, when it comes to systematic theology and gathering doctrines throughout the whole Bible and putting that together, that's going to be really good. In fact, we um, we started looking at justification and um, adoption, things like that, and it really, really, I don't know, it's good. It's stuff you know or you should know, but it really opens up your your mind to things when you read it you know, in its entirety. So that's some things that are coming up, and that those should be coming up on the uh, the Monday show here pretty soon. So, without further ado, let's uh, talk about some news here. What's going on here? I got a story here from uh, Newsweek. Oh, I thought this was interesting, is because everybody's offended nowadays. Everybody has prejudice against them, whether um, it's racial prejudice or gender prejudice. Sipping coffee prejudice. Uh, everybody's offended. And this was interesting because it says prejudice towards atheists means some people don't trust them on sex and relationships. I don't know what that has to do with anything, but the, the Newsweek article is a hit piece on Christianity is what it is. Because uh, the only ones that seem to be prejudiced towards atheists are non-atheists is what the article's saying, uh, which my personal experience is, it's just not true. My personal experience is um, I have uh, neighbors that I love dearly who are atheists, and I love these folks dearly. I mean, I really do. Um, they're a hoot. I think they're great people. They're beautiful people. They're just, uh, they're blinded by the God of this world. And uh, we pray for them, and we've... Uh, Told them the gospel. They know our stance, and I just pray that someday they will uh, have their eyes opened and they will see 
what they need for salvation. But there's no prejudice against those people. I've also have posted articles in the past and stuff about atheists and had some of our listeners actually, you know, uh, say we need to pray for these folks or they, they've known people in their lives that were atheists and they need prayer because they do because they are blinded by the God of this world. So anyway, it is a hit piece against Christianity. Um, and that's, that's why I find it interesting. It says there was an ad featuring Ron Reagan. Now he's the son of former president Ronald Reagan. And there was an ad that showed on one of the democratic primary debates it was a 30 second spot and it was run by the freedom from religion foundation. And in it, Reagan expressed concern that religious beliefs have gained too much political influence in the United States. And he signed off by describing himself as a lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. So I don't think that's cool. I mean, it's one thing, you know, you're doing a, a political commercial on a political show. And you have an organization called Freedom from Religious or Freedom from Religion Foundation. I could dig it. But do you have to sign off? As quote, quote, I'm a lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. And that's why I, I feel sorry for Mr. Reagan here, because he is blinded. He is, is truly blinded by the God of this world, which is uh, Lucifer, Satan. And um, that kind of blind activity is not just, uh, that's that's eternal, that's the very thing he says, I'm not afraid of burning in hell is the very thing that can uh, eternally torment him. And uh, I'd hate to see that happen to this man. His detractors expressed alarm. They were concerned that an unabashed atheist, a person who lacks belief in a God or gods could speak so bluntly on national television the ad inspired some strong reactions with some major networks, even banning it from the airwaves. And uh, it shouldn't be surprising. Research shows there's an intense prejudice against atheists in the U.S. So here's her hit piece right here. It says, of the approximately 25% proportion of the U.S. population who do not identify as religious... A little over 3% identify specifically as atheists. So it's very small. Although some researchers claim the actual number might be as high as 20%. Uh, they don't say what research this is. They don't say this because, well, you don't need to. Let's not mess up the facts with facts. Let's not mess up a good story with facts. So it goes on. It says prejudice towards atheists. Says because of this prejudice, people might be reluctant to identify themselves as atheists, even on questionnaires. Research show that atheists are trusted less than religious people. In fact, even atheists trust their fellow atheists less than religious people. They don't even trust each other. Well, it's kind of hard. How do you trust somebody who who can't see God in nature? I mean, you know, you just, you look around you uh, at nature and you look at the sky and the, how things work and you look at a little puppy dog and you look like a, a child and, and how could you possibly trust somebody who can't, uh, who can't even see that? So um, it says, until recently, a majority of Americans believe that atheists are not moral. Atheists are not moral. And like I said, I got neighbors who are atheists. They're very moral people. Uh, it's just a belief. Uh, they're blinded. A University of Kentucky scholar, Will Gorveas and colleagues, have found that people in several countries even tend to associate serial murder with atheism relative to religious belief. So I don't know what kind of study this is, but it sounds kind of honky. Um, they go on, they say social psychologists have spent years examining what causes some people to have negative feelings and thoughts uh, towards atheists. Some 
Some work argues, for example, that atheists are disliked because they remind religious believers of their inevitable mortality. I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, if you if you're if you're a biblical Christian, um, what you want is is your eternal life. You know you're not a citizen here. You know you don't belong here. That this is a demon infested alien controlled rock that we're on. It's a it is a probation prison planet, and we are to do the job we are to do while we're down here the work of the Lord that he has us to do. But this is in our home. And uh, when we die or we're raptured, either or, uh, we will be gone and we will have resurrected bodies and we will have not just immortality, but eternal life. So the thing that, you know, why some people uh, dislike, um, you know, atheists, religious uh, believers, that they're reminded of their inevitable mortality, uh, I don't think so. Uh, what they, they explain is that atheists deny the existence of an afterlife. And that's a shame because every culture, uh, every culture, you go back in history and you look at any Indian culture or African culture, Chinese culture, Egyptian culture, Middle East culture, I mean, on and on and on throughout history, they believe in an afterlife. It's, it's part of, it's part of the human nature. God has put a, an eternity into every human's heart. There's a yearning and a questioning. That's why they can look at nature and see the Godhead. Uh, so for, for these folks to deny that existence, they have to willfully deny it. They have to willfully uh, rebel against that kind of knowledge. So anyway, when reminded of death, this theory suggests religious people respond with increased prejudice towards atheists. Uh, I don't, I don't see how that can, how that can be. But anyway, this, this not let the facts get in the way of a good, good hit piece. Uh, there was a 2018 study on the prejudice that religious believers hold against atheists conducted along with our colleagues at Arias, I'm sorry, Arizona State University examined one previously unexplored cause of atheist prejudice, perceptions of their sexual behavior. So anyway, it, it, this thing goes on and on and it's just hitting the heck out of, you know, non-atheists thinking that atheists are, you know, gorillas in a cage or something like that. And I just, I just don't see that. Um, <laughs> in fact, there's one commenter on here, one, one, one comment on this. And they said, I suggest that your research should focus more on how people respond to things like con games. You will find that none of it has to make any real sense as long as you believe. Um <laughs> It's an interesting article because of what they're trying to what the, what they're trying to promote here. Now we got atheists who are now victims. Uh, people dislike atheists apparently, and the only ones that dislike atheists are religious people. So they're they're the bad guys. In fact, this all these stories here this week are about religious people, or specifically Christianity, being bad guys. Uh, Pete Buttengig, Button Gig, the Butt Monster. He faced criticism for calling Jesus a refugee. So apparently he needs some theological training. But this is what it is. This guy's a uh, wannabe politician. So he's going to use everything in his power to uh, make things politically related to his political agenda. That's all. That's all this is. It's not a big deal. South Bend, Indiana, Mayor Pete Putin uh, gig, gig, the butt monster faced a lot of criticism on Christmas Day after he said that Jesus Christ entered into the world as a refugee. So he apparently he tweeted this in quotes. He said, today I join millions around the world in celebrating the arrival of divinity on earth who came into this world, not in riches, but in poverty not as a citizen, but as a refugee. Um, yeah, so. I think he could have said worse things. But anyway. Kind of get what he was trying to say. He was trying to use it for his little political gain. Because, you know, he has he has plans uh, with the refugees and all that stuff. So he's trying to use it for political gain. I, I get what he's trying to do. His... Um, 
his tweet came just days after 2020 presidential candidate. Uh, he had released his plan calling for a significant increase in refugee admissions. So there you go. And he wanted to set admissions to a minimum of 95,000 illegal people. Uh, Button Boy's policies uh, paper specifically recalls biblical language to support his vision for immigration. He says, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Refers to a passage from the Gospels or something. And uh, apparently, uh, but a lot of people were upset because he made Jesus into a refugee. I, I would be more upset that he just he used the Lord for his political agenda. It's just uh, typical, 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 typical. New York Post. This one's, this one's a nasty one. Um, it's about a fire, but the fire occurred at these, uh, these two guys. They're, the, they're Brazilian. They have a Brazilian headquarters, and their headquarters were hit with Molotov cocktails and set on fire. And probably the reason is, is that they created a show about a gay Jesus. That's right. Um, and it was called, it's terrible. It's on Netflix. Netflix is what a, Netflix is what a hellhole that thing had become. I used to have Netflix years ago. And then it got weirder and weirder. Uh, and, I, and we found ourselves watching weirder and weirder stuff. And so we got rid of it. And uh, now, boy, I'm telling you, what a pit of hell uh, these things are. Hey, if you got nothing to do at night, I would say uh, instead of watching TV, uh, once you read God's word, it's it's just going to be more beneficial. I'm telling you, you'll be more intelligent. You'll be brighter. You'll see things the way they are. Um, plus, you'll do something for your own eternal life. It's really good stuff. Uh, instead of watching stuff like this, God, I hope no one watches this. It's called The First Temptation of Christ. It's a comedy. Uh, apparently, it's a... Um, a Brazilian comedy group in Rio de Janeiro. Apparently they got bombed on Christmas Eve. It was just weeks after the group launched a film on Netflix depicting Jesus as gay. They had a Christmas special called The First Temptation of Christ. And um, in 46 minutes of their so-called comedy, they portrayed Jesus bringing home his presumed boyfriend to Orlando to meet the Holy Family. And it prompted about 2 million people to sign a petition calling on the streaming service to remove the show because it offended Christians. You know, they wouldn't have done something like this to Muhammad um, or even, uh, you know, Orthodox uh, Jews. They, they wouldn't have done something like that. But they, uh, they do it to Christianity because they are Antichrist. And like I posted on the Facebook page, you know, it's these people don't so much hate Jesus as they fear him. They fear him. They don't hate him. They fear him. That's why they mock, because they're afraid. The demons in them are afraid. They know who Jesus is, and they tremble. Anyway, the sketch uh, group said that a security guard managed to contain the fire at its headquarters, and no one was hurt. The police in uh, Rio de Janeiro did not immediately respond for requests uh, for comments, and Netflix declined to comment. But on Christmas Eve, in early morning hours, the building was attacked by Molotov cocktails. And um, they said, we will move on more united, stronger, more inspired, and confident that the country will survive this storm of hatred. See, now it's hatred because... <laughs> Because they took our our religion, they took um, something precious to us, uh, our Messiah, our Savior, and made fun of him and besmeared him and made him a homosexual. And then when they get uh, a Molotov cocktail thrown at their building, set on fire, now that's hatred. That's hatred, see? What they did is not hatred. What What other people do is hatred. So they're confident they'll survive the storm of hatred and that love will prevail alongside freedom of speech. So obviously they don't know what love is as far as agape love uh, or they wouldn't have done such a show. 
Anyway, uh, let's see here. Brazil is home of the, uh, to the world's largest Catholic community. It's a fast-expanding evangelical community as well. And they have a lot of political influence. The president, Bolsonaro, he described himself as a proud homophobe. He once told an interviewer he would rather have a dead son than a gay son. Earlier this year, he suspended funding for a series of films, including a handful of LGBTQ themes. And, of course, the federal court struck that decision down. Uh, his son, Eduardo Bolsonaro, he called the Christmas special garbage, saying filmmakers do not represent Brazilian society. Anyway, another hit piece, obviously. Uh, that's by the New York Post, a hit piece. So let's take a quick uh, commercial break. We'll be back with the rest of the story, so hang in there. Recently, spiritual attacks on innocent people have increased considerably. This is partly due to society's transformation into a satanic cult. Most people are clueless or hopeless in combating this spiritual mayhem. We wish to offer two good books to overcome these attacks. First, Demons in My Marriage Bed, a true story of spiritual warfare, offers one of the most effective training systems in combating spiritual darkness in order to gain personal freedom. Second, Eyes to See Unseen Enemies teaches how to see the hidden dangers which are all around us, even in places we would least expect them. Both books can be purchased on Amazon.com as a paperback or ebook. It is our desire that you will take advantage of these opportunities to increase your effectiveness in spiritual warfare and learn how to fight back instead of being a victim. We'll see you on the battlefield. Okay, we're back. Let's see here. This is interesting. I have, um, as we end 2019, this is from um, Axios. It's the insane news cycles of 2019. It's a chart. Obviously, you can't see it. Um, and in the chart, they have a height uh, is a search interest in a given topic indexed to 100. Uh, so in this chart, every time they have a little mountain peak, there's big interest. In, I mean, huge spikes of interest. And then it's colored, and the colored is the average search interest between December 30th, 2018 to December 20th, 2019. And uh, let, me, let me read just some of the headlines here. We'll go... Uh, for the beginning here, I mean, huge spikes in the news. They're insane news cycles. And when I read the, uh, the titles here, what I want you to take notice of is, is no one is searching in the news. There's no spikes about eternal life or heaven or hell or the end of the age. Or, or the return of Christ, or, you know, there's nothing like that. This is all just a, a lot of demonic distraction. It's the God of the world blinding people. And you could, you could, you could tell by the, by the headlines, there's nothing here of any significance that you as a believer uh, would put any, well, any trust in or any, uh, you know, too much, too much thought into it. Uh, the, the number one is government shutdown, and then you had Mexico-U.S. border problems, Green New Deal, blackface, that was huge, North Korea, the uh, summit, Boeing 737, Brexit, Israel, SpaceX, Game of Thrones, huge spikes on that, Venezuela, IPO, China-U.S. trade war, Iran, Robert Mueller, mass shootings, Hong Kong, Jeffrey Epstein, recession, Hurricane Dorian, Ukraine plus Donald Trump, big spike, spike there. Greta Thunberg, are you serious? Huge. Syria, Turkey and Kurds, general motorist strike. Mark Zuckerberg, California and fires. Um, 2020 presidential election, baby Yoda and impeachment. Nothing there about God, nothing about eternal life, nothing about there. How do I, um, how do I get out of this mess? How do I help myself and other people I love? Nothing, 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 nothing. Because the news creates its own cycles and it creates its own news, right? So 
I mean, you can see the world here. What a mess. Uh, I would hate to just be like locked into any of these titles, thinking it's real and serious and affected my life. The year started with a record-breaking government shutdowns, ending with a third presidential impeachment in U.S. history, in between an onslaught of investigations, conspiracy scandals, and memes. Why It Matters, the chart based on search trends compiled by Google News Lab, highlights how short the public's attention span was as the media darted from one big thing to another. It, that's what it, it's like a reality show. It's just like a, it's like a sitcom, not a sitcom, but a soap opera, man. It just goes from one tragedy to a next tragedy to one story, one event to next event. It's just a, it's just a big show, big distraction. Unbelievable. Uh, in the era of President Trump and social media, surges of Google interest in the biggest events of the year only lasted about a week before the public's attention was drawn somewhere else. They don't remember. They don't care. Just a week. Some issues, such as the 2020 election and the Mexico-U.S. border, drew more steady attention, but fewer of the dramatic spikes of interest that other topics had. By the numbers, the news events that saw the largest single spike in Google interest compared to any other event on the list was Hurricane Dorian, which ravaged the Bahamas in early September. And that, what, that, why that's probably so, right? Why that's probably so is because it was actually real. It actually did stuff. It actually damaged people. People were actually physically affected, financially affected, emotionally affected by something that was real. It's not just made up junk. Uh, runners up, total made up junk, Game of Thrones, final season. That's where our heads are at. Government shutdown and, of course, Jeffrey Epstein, an impeachment tie. For impeachment, the highest peaks of Google interest came the week of September 22nd when uh, little Nancy Pelosi launched the impeachment inquiry against Trumpster. Uh, and the week of December 15th when Trump was impeached, Greta Thunberg, Thunberg, that thing, who was unknown at the beginning of the year, received surge of interest in late September and mid-December giving her or it, whatever it is, more search interest in the last three months than the China trade war, the 2020 presidential election, or Brexit. More people are searching this uh, <laughs> this global warming, whatever it is, Greta thing, than anything else. Um, so I just thought that was kind of interesting to end the year up. And now um, the way things ought to be. There's a nice little uh, story here from the Good News Network. It's church. It's a, actually, it was a Methodist church and a mosque. They joined forces together on Christmas to feed poor families, and then they offered free health screenings uh, to financially challenged people in the neighborhood. And they went beyond their, their religions, and they just did the right thing as human beings. And I think that's uh, it's a nice story. In a heartening example of interfaith compassion, a New York church, it's a Methodist church, like I said, uh, partnered with a mosque, and they fed low-income families, and then they offered free health care screenings for the holidays. On Christmas Day, the Westbury United Methodist Church partnered with the Islamic Center of Long Island in order to provide a warm meal and an even warmer welcome to financially struggled families. The church and mosque have been doing this. Uh, they've been doing the food for five years. But this is the first event they offered health consultations uh, because there's a lot of uh, medical professionals, physicians in their community. Uh, and that's the Islamic Center volunteer said that. So the mosque has a lot of doctors and medical professionals. And so they went and volunteered their time to give people health screenings. The two religious establish establishments hope that their collaborative charity work will help inspire others to look past their differences during the year ahead. And um, anyway, what they wanted to do is, is just help get beyond their religious bindings and help people because they're human. And I think that's a, a good way to end this. 
the day. All right? So anyway, we will leave, uh, I'll leave you with a song from Mesquite Cafe that uh, I did not write. The late, great Larry Norman wrote it, but I redid the song, and I'm singing it and playing it, and it is available everywhere. Music is available. iTunes, Spotify, um, Apple Podcast, blah, 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 blah. All right? So, good night, and we will, Lord willing, talk to you Monday. Sipping whiskey from a paper cup, you drown your sorrows till you can't stand. Take a look at what you've done to yourself Why don't you put the bottle back on the shelf Yellow fingers from your cigarette Your hands are shaking while your body sweats Why don't you look into Jesus He got the answer One old night, you sleep all day You take your money and throw it home Don't know how Why don't you look